everybody and welcome to the true crime squad this is katie weaver i'm here with my sister co-host and partner in crime christy brower hello hello what you got there right here with a little more than that right yeah <laughs> that's a good look uh this is nelly this is our daughter mars's new basset hound puppy we picked her up oh, yesterday nelly. and uh whoa right now... nelly <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. I like it. You're gonna, I called you her guys are going to say that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Uh, she is precious, as you can see. You guys, look she at how is. big her paws are. Look at oh that. Oh, my gosh. Her my feet God. are gigantic. And how long her little ears are. Oh, she's yes. so cute. And a she good girl. Is. She slept in her crate last night by herself uh, perfectly. And... Didn't say a word until about quarter to eight this morning and then cried her eyes out until I got her up. But uh, oh. right now, though, it's either go back in the crate while I record or I hold on to her until her dad comes and gets her. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Hopefully she'll be a good girl. But I also wanted to show you guys because I knew you would really like to see her. So oh, the other yeah. dogs are being um, hit and miss. Sometimes they're cute with her and try to play with her. And other times they get really rude to her. So they were so <laughs> naughty to her yesterday. She screamed and cried and peed all over me. So oh. <laughs> oh, no. it's taking a minute. And Fiona, our female sow, female sow, that's an oxymoron, our, our female pig. She is um, trying to mother her. She does this every time we bring a puppy into the house. And so she's trying to mother her and kind of gatekeep her and she's also in heat which is a horrible uh set of circumstances <laughs> really bad timing so mm. all of her hormones are firing which meant she spent the entire night molesting the kitchen chairs which <laughs> really sucks for anyone who likes to sleep in this house but <laughs> mm -hmm. but she sure wants to be this one's mother which yeah, mainly means she's she gonna allow that <laughs> Yeah, well, it basically means she follows her around, sniffs her constantly, and occasionally tries to flip her on her back so that she can sniff her belly. <laughs> yeah. But don't worry, oh we are goodness. closely supervising that because, uh, you know, she's much, much bigger than her and also not her mother. <laughs> so. Right. Oh, anyway. Not my mother. This is the circus that is my house currently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how's it going? uh good it's great i my house is less of a circus i guess I, mean, to... I got my botox on monday nice and i get i get botox for migraines mm -hmm. and uh i'm so glad oh, it good. wears off so i get it every 90 days in the last couple of weeks before it wears off all my headaches come back and then uh -huh. you know so i'm you know always just dying to get it and i'm so glad i got it so, oh, good. You haven't tried Botox for your migraines. Consider it if your doctor thinks it's a good idea because holy shit, it has changed my life. That's amazing. Who knew? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. some doctors, that's who. <laughs> Somebody did. I, I posted on social media the other day that whoever figured that out, I owe them something big like a puppy <laughs> for figuring that out. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not that one. Not this one. Yeah. No. Well... We have a big episode. It's Wednesday. So you guys, you get a double, uh, daily double from us today. Yeah. Because of course it is Wednesday. So it is also Wednesday night case updates tonight at seven. And there's a lot going on in the crime world. There's a lot to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably know that if you watched our Monday episode, the true crime roundup, my God, was a lot there. Crazy. And it's just yes. keeps rolling. So uh, I'm going to kick is. the mic over to you to lead us out with some serial killer news. Yes. Mexican police have identified who they believe to be an active serial killer in Tijuana, and it is a man from the United States. Oh, boy. So his name is Bryant Rivera, 
this is Bryant. And this is Bryant on some security footage in a hotel. So what's happened is that um, the police have found three sex workers murdered in hotel rooms in 2001 and 2002. And they have now due to, um, well, quite a few different things. I'll tell you kind of how they figured this out. Um, determined that they believe it is Bryant Rivera. They have had him arrested in California and they are working to extradite him to Mexico for trial. Mm -hmm. Just some serious shit, man. I don't know that I'd want to be tried as a serial killer in Mexico by any means. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Their case against him um, is actually the most recent victim. So I, there's not a lot publicly known about the first two. Uh, he is charged with femicide currently, which is murder of a woman, which is how they how they um, couch it in yeah. uh, in Mexico. Yeah. Um, they are considering him a serial killer because they believe they actually have three deaths on him. Wow. So they're, they're talking right now about, um, but the these were from of, 20 years ago. No, no, no. 20, 21, 2022. Oh, okay. I think I heard you say 2001, 2002, but maybe, oh, maybe that's just what maybe my brain I heard. did. I don't know. Well, I'm also going to talk about the illicit attorney case that happened in 2001. So I might have my, my, my years mixed up. Oh, okay. but we're talking about uh, the killing of Angela Carolina Acosta Flores. So she was a dancer at a club in Tijuana and a sex worker. Mm -hmm. She was last seen entering a hotel room. Um, prosecutors say it was actually rented by Brian Rivera. And this was on January 24th of 2022. Okay. Her body was found in the bathroom the next day, um, and the autopsy showed she had been asphyxiated. Um, oh, boy. The, the, there is footage seen of him seen leaving the hotel room before midnight that night, and he never went back. And then he crossed the U.S.-Mexico border on foot 13 minutes after leaving that room. Wow. So this, is, this was right across the border. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a witness who actually referred to uh, Rivera by his first and last name. Wow. Uh, and told them that she had seen him at this club. Mm -hmm. The club is next to the hotel where Angela was found. Okay. Um, and this witness actually said that she knew him as a, as a regular at this club. Mm -hmm. There was another witness that gave a description of him and his face um, and clothing noting that he was wearing a pandemic mask and um, that was like not fitting correctly. And so they saw that he had an acne scarred face. Let's look mm. at this picture of Brian Rivera again. You can kind of see it. This isn't a great picture, but he has acne scars. Okay. And he was identified by those by another witness. Interesting. Yeah. So what the police are saying is that um, all three victims had sex before they were killed. Um, and he is known to frequent Tijuana's red light district, which is known as Zona Norte. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know exactly what led authorities to Rivera initially, but there is something about a vehicle that he drives a truck that, um, he, they have images of him crossing the border, um, on January 25th of 2022. Okay. So they've got quite a bit. They have not released anything else about the other two cases. Mm. Um, other than they are, they've spanned between September, 2021 and February, 2022. We don't know if Angela Acosta was his last victim or if there is another one since mm -hmm. her mother identified her in February of 2022. Uh, so that's what we know wow. at this point. Um, but he is currently, he has been arrested and they're working on extradition. Extradition can take a really long time to another country. Yeah. Um, they're saying it could take a couple months to a couple of years to extradite oh, him. Crazy process. Yeah. It, it is. It is. But at least in that time, he's in jail and cannot. Yeah. Any other women 
because that is what's terrifying to me. Yeah. You know, how, and, and, and are these three vi victims his only victims? Right. That, There's that was my question. question too. Well, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that the, uh, the Mexican authorities are taking it seriously. I mean, how many times have we seen uh, sex workers being murdered that nobody cared at all? Right. It's so scary thinking about uh, one of the most prolific uh, serial killers in the United States that killed, you know, they say upwards of like 60 sex workers and he got away with it for a really long time because nobody cared. Right, right. Tons of them like that. Like like Samuel yeah. Little, is that who you're talking about? Yeah, that's who I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he killed sex workers. And he traveled across country and mm -hmm. was doing it in multiple states. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he went undetected for a really, really long time. Yeah. So thank God they're taking it seriously and also uh, that they have a beat on him. So good. Yeah. It'll be interesting to watch this play out. Yeah, so we'll keep you updated as we see what goes on with this. Of course, his parents are standing behind him and he's fighting extradition and, you know, all that stuff, all that legal stuff's going to go on for a while. But we'll give you an update when we know, when we know yeah. something. Most definitely. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to kick the mic back to you for our main case, which is an MMIW. Yes, it is. So... You may have heard of this case. Uh, you may not have. It's flying a little below the, the radar, and it needs to have some sunshine. So, yeah, that's it's true. It does. It. This happened at Camp Pendleton, in California. This is a Marine Corps base, and we're talking about a missing fourteen-year-old girl. Yeah, that uh, went missing. Well, she went missing in June, and she, her grandma, she has, grandma has custody of her, and grandma says that she has run away before. So she uh, waited for a few days. So she first went missing uh, somewhere around June 9th. Uh, grandma waited four days because, again, she had uh, ran away before and then just come back. So grandma wasn't too worried. After four days, she was worried. So then she called the police. And she was missing until June 28th. On June 28th, military police found her in the barracks of Camp Pendleton uh, with a, a Marine there. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. So she was uh, returned to grandma and the family, particularly her aunt Cassandra, are really speaking out because they feel like the military is trying to uh, just sweep this under the rug. And also uh, there's some swirlings that maybe they're trying to blame her, that she maybe lied about her age. She's 14. I will say this loudly and with my whole chest. She cannot consent to sex. She also cannot she can't consent, consent to, anything. to anything else. Yes, to being transported, no. to being brought to this place. Now, the aunt is saying that she was sold, that she was trafficked, that she was sold for sex to this person who took her to the barracks. Now, how did he get her in there? So I've right? done some reading and some research on that. And it sounds like it's probably not as hard as you think. As long as the uh, military personnel shows ID, depending on who, uh, you know, is, is guarding the door, may or may not have even asked for her ID. It's also possible. What would that a 14-year-old girl be doing with this guy? I mean. It's possible that he could have sold her off as his uh, sister or daughter or you know, a family member, it's also possible that he brought her in in a, a duffel bag or something like that, that maybe was completely, uh, you know, uh, on, on the DL. We don't know. And we probably won't ever know because these are things, these are details that will likely be kept really quiet. Right. Um, the family, of course, uh, they're very concerned. They're very concerned that it's not being taken seriously. But then last Thursday, there was some 
uh, relief, some hope when this soldier was actually, or this Marine, sorry, uh, was actually uh, arrested or at least taken into custody mm -hmm. and questioned. He has since been released uh, back to his, uh, back to service, back to his oh, uh, great. guard. Yeah. So we know that uh, they have questioned him. We also know that they have, they're hanging on to him, which could mean that they're just, uh, they, they're saying that there is an ongoing investigation. And so they're just doing their due diligence, which I really, really hope is true. It's mm -hmm. hard to trust sometimes in situations like this. This is an article from uh, the OC register back in 2017. Uh, over the course of four years, back from 2013 to 2017, there were 24 sexual allegation reports, sexual assault allegation reports at... That says 624. Or 624, sorry, yeah. 624 <laughs> sexual allegation reports at Camp Pendleton. They have a problem with sexual assault here, obviously. Yeah. And I'm assuming because of that, that they have a problem with doing shit about it. Right. Now, one thing we know, uh, we have know a little bit, uh, maybe, about how she was found. She wasn't found because police thought she was there. But there's a register. This is a daily register, a handwritten register that's taken of uh, goings on at the barracks. And this register shows that uh, a Marine with a CLB-5 got arrested for having sex with a minor in the barracks. The duty log book reads, 13-year-old female minor found in room 343. Duty notifies barracks manager. PMO is called to check it out. Police come, so on and so forth. Mm. So... We believe that's actually what happened. Somebody there finally went, I don't think this girl's supposed to be here. Oh, you think? We oh, also God. don't know how long she was there. It's right. possible that she was uh, only there a brief time, that she was actually had been kidnapped by someone else and was being trafficked. And this guy bought her and took her back to the barracks and only had her there for a short time. It's also possible that she'd been there for a couple of weeks. We don't mm. know. It, uh, from what I've read, it sounds like these barracks do have uh, one and two man uh, roommate arrangements. Mm -hmm. So it's that this person had their own room and yeah. were just able to keep her uh, detained there. Uh, it, and again, she could have been there by her own free will. I, we're not saying that she may be wasn't. But what we're saying is she can't be there by her own free will legally. It, it's possible right. she chose no. to stay, but it doesn't matter. She was 14. Right. None so, of this matters. This is all matters. trafficking, and it's all yeah. sexual assault, and it's all kidnapping and illegal. Yep. All of it. All of it. <sighs> So that's the fear of the family is that the uh, military is kind of trying to gaslight them and the press and the system into, uh, you know, saying that she, this was consensual and that she chose this. But uh, let's just, we just cannot reiterate enough. No. When the press says shit like this, they need to be called out on it. Every no, she didn't. Time. No, she can't. She is 14. She cannot right. consent ever, period. The press has a real... Mm -hmm. It's a real pattern yeah. of implying that Native girls, Black girls, Hispanic girls um, are women. Mm -hmm. I'm referring to them as women rather than mm -hmm. this is a child. And if this girl was white, she would be ca being called a white child, a white girl, a white child, you know. Right. But because we're talking about um, a Native child, these girls always get portrayed as being mm -hmm. older and adult, you know, yeah. evocative and, you know, seducing and all that kind of shit. It makes me so goddamn angry. Mm -hmm. She's a little girl. She's a little 14 year old girl. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Yep. Regardless, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. The aunt actually did a TikTok that said, if I go missing or end up murdered, the people potentially responsible could possibly be located here at Camp Pendleton. The family yeah. is very afraid of backlash. They are. 
Yeah. Very afraid. With good reason, I think. Yeah. So, of course, NCIS says, calm down, we're investigating it, all is well. But for the public, I think it's hard to trust that at this point. Yeah, but is after it? After what we've seen at some of the other, like at uh, Fort Hood uh, and other you know, military bases where, and, and what we know of the uh, amount of sexual assault that's going on on these bases, yeah. is it, can we just calm down and trust that? Sorry, no, I don't, I don't that really for one second. think so. Yeah. Mm -mm. No. Now the family, of course, is saying they can't say everything they know, but right. they are saying that she was kidnapped and sold into, uh, sold for sex. So well, I would imagine at 14 years saying. old, she could tell them if that had happened. Right. You know. Uh, well, and there's one other piece with her. She is learning disabled. The aunt said that her mm. decision-making skills rival that of about an eight-year-old. Okay. Which I think so, uh, even more vulnerable. Even more vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So that's what we know. We'll keep an eye on this one to the best of our ability. Again, there's a lot that's probably going to fall through the cracks, but we have this badass aunt that just won't sit down and shut up. So good on her yeah. for being brave enough to speak up and also Absolutely. for being willing to, uh, yeah, to put herself out there because she certainly is taking somewhat of a risk. So. Mm -hmm. She is. And, you know, my, my hope definitely for her is that she's safe. Definitely. Yeah. And speaking out. Yeah. And that a true, honest uh, investigation is made yeah. into this case. Absolutely. Because this is, it's a big deal. And there needs to be well, a very is, good investigation. Yep. And, and if also, this has happened to one girl, how many other girls is this happening to? exactly my thoughts as well this isn't the first time it's probably not going to be the last time though it should be there needs to be a really exhaustive uh, investigation and some prosecution that comes along mm -hmm. with it not only to uh if if what the family's saying is true it's all allegedly right now but uh if she was trafficked whoever trafficked her also needs to be held responsible like we need to right. unravel some things i i'm bothered and you, when you read through comments on some of these stories it's pretty horrifying the blaming of, of the victim i'm bothered by all of the people that i'm seeing running out and watching that film that just came out about child sex trafficking in the u.s that is you know something that people claim to be passionate about but then when we see it in action the first thing they do is point the finger at the victim right what the hell do people think child sex trafficking is right this is it right here. This is it. This is what this child is sex it. trafficking in the U.S. is. This. Yeah. This right here. So, again, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, and hopefully there will be some justice here and some safety put in place for this family and for everybody else. Absolutely. So, with that, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for a true crime update. Yes. <laughs> So last week we did an update episode on the Alyssa Turney uh, murder case and uh, Michael Turney's trial began last week So and is continuing this week. So I want to tell you a little bit about what has happened so far um, and kind of where this is all headed. So the judge thinks that this trial is going to last until the 20th of July and then they suspect that by then it will be with the, with the jury. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, Sarah Turney was on the stand and Sarah is the driving force behind getting Michael Turney arrested and tried in the first place. Mm -hmm. She is Sarah Turney's younger sister. And so she talked a lot about being brainwashed by her dad and that there were a lot of things that she believed at the time that Alyssa went missing that she realizes now were not true, that he lied to her and got her kind of involved, including with him. And that she realizes now that the things that he was telling her were not true. Right. I mean, she was just a child. She was, she was just a kid and she didn't yeah. understand what was happening, but there are some of things, um, you know, of course, um, Alyssa has never been found. 
And so this is a this is a bodiless second degree murder trial. Yeah. So some questions that the prosecutor asked of Sarah, did she want Alyssa out of her life forever? And she said, no. And when asked why not, she said, because she took care of me. She said she remembers the day that she went missing. She helped her get ready for school in the morning, that she always did her hair and did her nails and helped her pick out her clothes and did the big sister thing. Sarah was 17. Yeah. Or I mean, Alyssa was 17 and Sarah right. was 12. Right. Um, Her mom had passed. And so she was taking mom, mom duties. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Yeah. And she did, um, you know, help take care. Of, she took care of her in a lot of ways. So Sarah was asked, um, you know, have you asked your dad what happened to Alyssa? And she said many times uh, he told me he will tell me on his deathbed. Uh, she has said in the past that he told her that he would um, he would admit to it if they would give him a lethal injection within 10 days. Which is <sighs> so manipulative and such bullshit, mm -hmm. you know. And that doesn't happen. So, yeah. Um, she told the court that he had hidden cameras in their house to watch Alyssa. And that he pointed out a camera that was in a vent. And he, Michael, had told her, uh, this is to watch your sister. I don't want her to know that that camera is there. When the police searched Michael Turney's house in 2008, so seven years after Alyssa went missing, they found totes and totes and totes of VHS tapes, of surveillance, and audio tapes. He was recording her in the house he was also wow. recording all of her phone calls what the but hell you know what day doesn't have any recordings the day she went missing oh you betcha this die this dude was recording everything except mm -hmm. for that day i mean they also found um when when they searched the house they also found a contract and Apparently, he forced uh, Sarah or, or Alyssa mm -hmm. to sign a contract stating that Michael was not sexually abusing her. Right. How creepy is that? Right. Who that does that? Seem, that doesn't seem good well, at all. Right. And all the surveillance stuff, because what do teenage girls do in their house? You know, shower, change yeah. their clothes, change go to clothes. the bathroom. Yeah. Right. Gross. Yeah. So the defense was pretty aggressive with her. Um, but, you know, I mean, Sarah's ready. She has been on this for a long time now. You know, they were trying very hard to paint Alyssa as just being a rotten teenager mm -hmm. who just wanted to live her own life and ran away. Oh. Um, they said to Sarah, one of the defense attorneys said to Sarah, you said that Alyssa was unpredictable. And she said, because I believed that at the time, there were a lot of things that, that she said as a little kid that she mm -hmm. was just repeating to the police things that her dad oh, had said sure. to her. She had been coached for years. Yeah. 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 Um, but also, she's 17. Of course, she's unpredictable. Who isn't right. she's 17? a 17? 17-year-old girl. Yeah. yeah. Um, they also interviewed um, a friend that worked with her at Jack in the Box while she worked there. They um, they interviewed or they questioned her older brother, John. And then her her biological father. So Sarah and Alyssa were half sisters. And so it's it's weird, but Alyssa's mother had full custody of her mm -hmm. and when she died that custody went to michael turney so he still had custody of her even though he was her stepfather so stephen strom is her biological father mm -hmm. he didn't have custody of her and he's been in court throughout the trial and has really struggled with mm -hmm. it with all of it and he he says that he does absolutely believe that michael killed her yeah. Um, he's never seen her, you know, it's not like she went running to him or right. any family member because she didn't. No. Um, John Turney, who is uh, an older brother, said that, um, you know, she was just my little sister. She was fun, loving and just like a teenager. You know, mm -hmm. he's, she said he was a lot like me as a teenager. Mm -hmm. So they've called five witnesses so far. 
Um, they talked to her friend, Jessica Lang. They had made plans to hang out later in the day at school that day, because this was the last day of school on her junior, at her junior year. Um, there was supposed to be a party that um, Alyssa and her boyfriend were supposed to go to. Uh, but she got a phone call from Michael asking if she knew where Alyssa was. Mm -hmm. You know, he set up a lot of shit. And she never saw or heard from Alyssa again. So she just ran away. She left her wallet and her phone home. And then she never contacted any of her friends or family ever again. Sure, so, that tracks. Right? Yeah. That's what 17-year-olds do. Yeah. Yeah. So James Turney, who is Alyssa's stepbrother, uh, took the stand also. He talked about Michael and kind of his history about how he worked as an electrician and in law enforcement. And remember when he was arrested, when they searched his house in 2017, they found like, or no, this was, not, this was in 2008. Sorry, in 2008, when they searched his house, he had all of these bomb making things and explosives and stuff because he was going to bomb this electrician's guild uh -huh. that he had used to work for. Right. Um, so he, uh, James remembers his dad working, you know, as an electrician. And then he did yeah. work in law enforcement for a while too. Um, he said that he remembers Michael telling him how, uh, about a phone call that he got a few days after Alyssa disappeared and that the, he believed the caller may have been Alyssa. Now, the story is that Michael says that it was Alyssa on the phone and she, all she did was swear at him and hang up. Uh -huh. But um, what he told James is there was nothing on the other end of the phone and that it was just static or garbled. And so he, James said that he never said that he spoke to Alyssa when he told James this story. Interesting. So that is a big discrepancy because yeah. he set that call up to make sure we know now that he actually had someone make that yeah. call for him in California. Right. He paid someone to make that call. Yeah. Yeah. So James says that he also went to Michael in 2007 wanting to know what really happened to Alyssa. And, you know, they continued to uh, talk about, you know, that she was a free spirit and didn't like her dad's rules. And, and then they also said that um, Michael spent time and money searching for Alyssa. Sarah remembers one time going to California to search for Alyssa, you know, the fake California. Right. He never searched for her in Arizona. No. Um. They brought John back on the stand because they were trying to say that Alyssa wanted her freedom and she just wanted to run and be a free spirit. They brought John back on the stand, um, one of the prosecutors, and they said, you said that Alyssa enjoyed her freedom. Based on your relationship, did you believe that she wanted freedom from you? Like, was she trying to run away from her family? And, and uh -huh. he said no. John right. said no. No. So these are the things we know so far. Um, I'm really glad that there are other family members and other people who knew Alyssa yes. around that time that are here to speak. Because, you know, they're just trying to blame all of this on Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Alyssa, who has never made any contact with a single friend or family member right. since the day that she disappeared. Mm -hmm. She also didn't take her cell phone or her wallet with her when she supposedly mm -hmm. ran away. I think Or touch her away, money in the bank. And she had a chunk of change in the bank. She did. And she did never, never touch that money. There's no indication that Alyssa lived past that day she went missing. Yeah, not so at all. That's what's and happening also, in the trial. Michael Turney is completely bonkers. Oh, he is. He's scary as hell. I mean, he yeah, literally yeah. was, you know, all of the surveillance that he was doing in their house and on their phone right. calls. Holy and shit. then the, the, all the, plans to bomb to bomb that electrician's guild and, and the yeah. explosives he had he did 10 years in prison for that yeah not normal then, no not normal at all so i mean there's a lot of this but it's all circumstantial because there is no body there's no blood there's no dna there's nothing the only thing they have is that he replaced his pickup his vehicle um not long after Alyssa went missing and he basically went and bought the same truck. Like he traded his in and bought a truck that was just like the one he traded in. And there are questions about if Weird. he was worried that there was 
you know, evidence, evidence in the truck. But it's long gone now. Sure. Wow. That's wild. So those are the things that have happened so far. We'll keep updating you on this. I just really, really hope that they've got enough to convince this jury because it's a lot of circumstantial stuff that's tough to do without a body. It, it worries yeah, me a lot. It is. For sure. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. All righty. Well, this is Wednesday. So we'll be back tonight at 7 p.m. Mountain Time for case updates. Uh, mm -hmm. But until then, please take good care of yourselves. Go do something good for you. You know you deserve it. This mm -hmm. has been yet another production of the True Crime Squad. Bye, everybody. Thank <music> you.